When the summer season rolls in, it seems like we all get so busy, and the last thing you need to worry about are your plants. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Coming up next, we'll take a look at some easy to care for plants for your garden. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, for me, the summer is ironic in that it's the season when the garden is so full of bounty, but it's also the time of year that we take long periods of time off for vacation. So in today's show, I thought we'd focus on some plants that don't mind a little neglect while we're away. We'll visit a succulent enthusiast who will show us some beautiful plants that are not only great conversation pieces, but they're extremely easy to grow. And if you live in an apartment, have a patio, or are dealing with other small spaces, they're perfect. We'll also visit with a woman known as the Cactus Queen, who will share some advice on how to grow these strange yet beautiful plants for yourself. Plus, if you're looking for a colorful way to fill in those shady spots in your garden, I'll share some tips for growing hydrangeas and show you how to get the color you want out of them. And for those sunnier parts of the garden, how about a deep, beautiful violet flower called indigo spires? We'll take a look at this exceptional salvia as well as some others you'll want to know about. And last but not least, we're going to take a look at one of my summer favorites, fresh corn, and make a delicious corn pudding. Now let's see what the Cactus Queen has in store for us. We'll visit with her after the break, so don't go away. When most of us think of houseplants, we probably think of something leafy and green, not prickly like these cacti and succulents. But you know, these plants make remarkable houseplants, particularly for those of us who forget to water from time to time. Among the succulents and cacti, is there a, a group of plants that you consider better for the home? Yes, uh, Hawadias and Gusterias make wonderful houseplants. You can put them on windowsills or you can make nice, uh, a nice arrangements. Grouping them together in yeah, a container. Yeah, grouping them together. They need some light, but uh, diffuse light, they will do very, very well. What about overwatering? Is that a common yeah. problem? Yes. Most people kill their plants, them cactus and succulents, from overwatering. You water them when they dry. If it's completely dry, then you water all the way through, but don't let them stand in water. And then l let it dry out completely from that moment. Yes. And then repeat the watering. And I only do that from March till end of October. In the winter time, you can give them once a month a light watering. Now, some people think when they hear cactus or succulents, they don't need no water. I had somebody, they bought a cactus here. After two years, he came, one of them reported and said, something wrong with it. And I said, uh, did you report it? No, he said. <laughs> How about watering? He never watered that oh, plant no. in two years. Even cacti should be watered. That's right. That's right. What about fertilizing cacti? Yeah, I do fertilize a very low dosage from April till middle of September. I, uh, a light dosage, only normally eight strength, and then you can do it every time you water. Now when you say uh, eight strength, you cut it down to very dilute, yeah. one eighth. One eighth, I yes. see. I like to look at them every day when they come from the day you put the seed until they come up to they sprout, you know, it's a lot of excitement. And even my husband, I, he got hooked on it too. Every night after dinner, we went out in the greenhouse looking about the progress they made. <laughs> <laughs> well, your passion certainly comes through. Now, ease of care is a phrase you're probably going to hear over and over again in this show, and that's because it's one of my top criteria in choosing a house plant. Now, another group of plants that has some of the same low maintenance characteristics as the cacti are the succulents. There's such a wide range of colors and shapes when it comes to these fascinating plants, and they're perfect for people on the go or as desk plants. Robin Stockwell of Succulent Gardens tells us more. Sure, those are neat. 
Robin, why do all these plants look like they're from Mars? Well, mainly because they've had to adapt to rough environments in which water was not available. You have a, a group of plants that oftentimes are completely unrelated in the plant world, but because of drought or frozen uh, water or salty water, the plants have over a period of time adapted so that they can store water long periods of time and they become kind of thick, juicy uh, plants and, and have the ability to store that water for long periods. Alan, I do feel that succulents are becoming more popular. People are on the go all the time. They're not home all the time. They're living in smaller spaces. And sometimes our lifestyle means that a plant has to be able to live in a harsh environment because we're, we're not there to take care of it. And so small spaces, apartments, little patios, small planters, succulents are ideally suited to this kind of an environment. If you look at these plants, there's just lots of color, lots of variety. People need to really get out there and just dig in, put them in the soil, have fun with them, use all of the principles they've used with the plants in their garden. Just use their imagination. Have a good time. Yeah. Many succulents are ideal for those areas of the garden that are constantly being bombarded by the rays of the sun. But what do you plant in the shadier parts of the garden? I have the colorful answer when we come back, so don't go away. Like everyone else, I like solutions to problems. And here's a plant that can help you with some of those more difficult areas around the garden. This is a hydrangea. It's a plant that I've found to be perfectly suited for growing in areas where you don't have much light or it might be particularly moist. You're probably familiar with the old-fashioned variety. The interesting thing about these old-fashioned or big-leafed hydrangeas is that the same plant can bloom either pink or blue. You see, the difference is all about soil chemistry. If you want pink hydrangeas like this, the soil needs to be slightly alkaline, and you can achieve this by simply applying lime. Now, if you want them to be blue, the soil needs to be slightly acidic, and that can be done by adding aluminum sulfate. The name hydrangea, in part, means water, and they come by this name honestly. You see, these plants like to be consistently moist. That's why you so often find them growing on the north side of houses, where the temperature is cool and the soil is damp. This creamy white variety that I have growing in my center garden is called Annabelle, and we've caught it at one of my favorite stages of development. Because within the same plant, there are nice subtle variations in bloom size and color. Annabelle hydrangeas are wonderful in contrast with plants with variegated foliage, like this dogwood and this variegated miscanthus grass. These large blossoms will persist through the summer, right up until the fall, at which time I'll bring them in for drying. There's no question these are beautiful in the garden, but if cared for properly, you can also use them inside. Let me give you an example. This variety of hydrangea is called PG. It's one of my favorites. And during the summer, the blooms get so large, they actually weight the plant down. So I feel like I'm doing it a favor by removing them. There are two methods you can follow to preserve these blooms, and both involve drying. The first is rather simple. All you do is remove the leaves like this along the stem and bundle five or six of them together and hang them in a cool, dry place. The other actually involves water. And that may sound odd, but let me show you what I mean. Just prepare a solution of two parts water and one part glycerin. You can find this at your local pharmacy. Now the way this works is the water and the glycerin are drawn through the stem of the plant and the water evaporates through the petals, leaving the glycerin. This makes the bloom more soft and supple to touch. And it also helps preserve the color and the shape of the bloom longer. To help with the uptake of the solution, I cut the stems at a slight angle before sliding them into the vase. It's important to remember that the best time to cut hydrangeas is when the petals are showing a slight green color. Here's another variety of hydrangea that I planted just last year called Lace Cap. The name obviously comes from the lacy appearance of the bloom. Now, what I find interesting about this plant is that in a single blossom, you actually have two kinds of flowering going on. These tiny little flowerets in the center are fertile. They have both male and female parts while on the edge, these large showy ones are sterile. They serve to lure pollinators. 
No matter what variety of hydrangea you choose, you'll find that they like plenty of humus or organic matter in the soil and consistent moisture. If you've got a shady area, you might give one of these guys a try. Next up, we'll take a look at what's new in my garden. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. In today's show, we're taking a look at summer survivors in the garden. Earlier, we visited Ann Sheen, the Cactus Queen, in California, where we saw her dizzying array of cacti and succulents. What a collection. Robin Stockwell provided some tips on using succulents in small spaces, and even suggested them for use on your office desk. I showed you how blooming hydrangeas can be just the ticket for shade gardens. Now let's take a look at a plant that can make a glorious addition to any sunny location. You see, the salvias are such a great family of plants. There's so many wonderful ones to choose from for our gardens. Two of my favorites are indigo spires and Mexican sage. Now in colder parts of the country, these might be considered annuals, but with results like these, they're well worth replanting every year. Just take a look at indigo spires. It's a showstopper in my garden all summer long. The deep blue-violet flowers continue to appear week after week despite hot temperatures and high humidity. Like many of the other sages or salvias I've grown in the past, indigo spires promises to continue flowering until the first cold days of autumn, as does Mexican brush sage. You see, Mexican brush sage or salvia leucantha begins blooming in late August and continues until frost. The combination of their striking velvet flowers and sheer size make them a dramatic feature in the autumn landscape. These plants easily grow three to four feet each year and have little or no problem with pests. The flowers are attractive to hummingbirds and to flower arrangers, but for different reasons. Hummers go for the nectar in these tubular flowers, and florists find these long, elegant spikes, ideal for their designs, whether they're cut fresh or dried. Now drying Mexican sage is really a snap. All you do is after you cut the stems, strip the foliage, bundle them together, and tie them with a rubber band and hang them in your garage. To grow this plant, you want to make sure you give it plenty of full sun. It thrives in the hottest temperatures. It can also grow quite tall, so I always cage mine early in the season. This will keep them from falling over. Now another method I've used is actually cutting them back at midsummer at about halfway. This keeps them from growing tall and spindly. Mexican sage will freeze if temperatures drop below 25 degrees. So each winter I mulch mine heavily and often they come back the next spring from the roots. But even if they didn't, I'd always plant this plant as an annual because of its spectacular flowers. Now as I mentioned earlier, whether a salvia is perennial or annual depends on where you live. One of my favorite annual varieties for growing in containers and the flower bed is one called Salvia Picante Salmon. It's such a great color. This plant is ideal for containers. I like to use it with my simple container recipe as a tall and spiky element. You see, I like to use it at the back of a container along with some round and full plants in the middle and a cascader to spill over the edge. And as you can see, its salmon color blends beautifully with other summer sun-loving favorites. Now let's move on to another winter for summer. When we come back, we'll take advantage of one of this season's most popular foods, corn. Plus, I'll share with you the answer to the question on your screen. Welcome back. Well, believe it or not, the oldest corn known to man is popcorn. Popcorn dates back at least 6,000 years, and we thought we were up on the times. Just look at this beautiful corn. It's so delicious this time of year. This is one of my favorite varieties called peaches and cream. In my opinion, the best corn is locally grown and in season. Fresh corn from the farmer's market is an all-American treat. And it seems like year after year, corn just gets a little sweeter to me. And that's not just my imagination. You see, advances in genetic engineering continue to improve corn, making it sweeter. And it's also helping it to hold its sugars longer. Let me explain what I mean by this. The flavor of corn depends on several things, the variety you choose, and when it's harvested and cooked. Corn is sweeter 
when it's collected and served before the sugars in the kernel can turn to starch. If you don't grow your own corn, you obviously don't have any control over when it's harvested. But with it so plentiful this time of year and affordable, I like to buy more than I can eat right away and preserve it for eating later on in the year. There's nothing to this. Just cut an inch or so off the end of the tip of the ear. Then slide the corn into plastic bags to store in the freezer. Leaving the shucks intact will protect the kernels from freezer burn. One of the most fascinating things for me about this American native is how it's pollinated. You see, the pollen is produced up here in the tassels. The pollen then falls down to the silks on each individual ear. Each one of these silks goes back to a point on the cob, and when pollination occurs on each one of them, a kernel of corn is formed. Just look at all of these golden kernels. It's ideal for eating many ways, from corn on the cob to a delicious summer corn pudding, like this one I'm preparing. To get started, I shuck six ears of corn and remove the corn from the cob with a knife and scrape each one to get all of the milk. This makes about three cups. Then I added one chopped medium-sized onion and one teaspoon of minced garlic, along with a half a teaspoon of salt and some pepper. Now I'm gonna saute all of this together over medium heat for about 10 minutes in one tablespoon of olive oil and one tablespoon of butter. And to give it a little extra zip, I'll add three chicken bouillon cubes. Next, I'll combine five eggs, a tablespoon of flour, one and two thirds cups of milk, and three fourths of a cup of grated Parmesan cheese. Once these ingredients are all blended together, it's time to add the corn saute. And you just wanna make sure that it is cooled. Now for the final ingredient. Fresh out of the garden, one cup of coarsely chopped basil. Just add it to the mix. Now, I'll blend this together and put it in a one-quart baking dish that's been greased. And I'll bake this for about 40 minutes at 375. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you've been inspired to fill your home and garden with some of those exceptional plants. And make sure you satisfy your taste buds with that delicious corn pudding. It is some kind of good. You can find all the information in the show and that recipe on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile